everybody. Welcome to a very special episode. Every episode is special, but this one is very special because we are joined by someone who has actually driven race cars, Matt Tiff. Matt, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on for this uh, special episode, I guess. So honored to be part of that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate it. James is here also, as always. Uh, I am Mark. And uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna wrap about Matt's career and what you know what he's done in NASCAR, what he's doing now, and you know and just and just talk, just just talk about racing because we like to talk about racing. There's lots of racing going on right now. They raced last night, they raced tonight, and they're gonna race tomorrow. So lots of racing to talk about. Uh, first off, Matt, I'll start with the basic question of since you left the racing. Since you left the seat at the you know during November 2019, what have you been up to and and what's been going on with you? Yeah, um, I'd say the the first thing is trying to figure out what the heck happened. Um, you know, obviously the the story came out that I had the seizure at Martinsville, so um, it's still even ongoing uh, to this day, kind of trying to figure out what's been um, you know what was the underlying cause and and you know the uh, the ultimate goal is for me to get back in the seat someday. So you know what the um, with that being said, I got to figure out what happened. So I've been working with some different doctors uh, first down here, but then now I'm actually going up to Cleveland to speak with some folks up there that uh, have worked with other athletes and, and are a little bit more experienced in, in this sort of a situation. So um, fingers crossed we uh, get down to the bottom of it and can figure out what happened, get rid of the problem, and uh, never have it happen again. But uh, other than that, um, you know, I actually, in December, my wife and I, we got married. So that was pretty exciting. Um so had that happen, um, and then she's uh, she's owned this online uh, boutique store, the women's clothing store for a while, called the Reese Boutique. And so um, she's been moving into a storefront. So uh, I've been playing part business owner with her for a little bit. So I've uh, been staying busy and then uh, trying to troll back at people on Twitter because I have more time to do that now. <laughs> yeah, we've noticed we've noticed that a lot. We've seen you on Twitter a lot, and. I don't know. I remember messaging you and being like, just manage social media accounts, man, because you get it. Like you understand how to like meme, how to make jokes. Like, and it's, it's a fine art that a lot of people think they can do, but it, it, it takes, it takes the right person to be able to do it. Like a lot of people think that that's actually what James and I do for a living. And a lot of people think they can do what we do. And it's, it's really a lot harder than you think. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a little different for sure. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's weird because on the driver's side, I mean, you have to you have so many requirements of okay, you gotta you gotta plug this sponsor, you gotta say this thing, and and it's I guess you know being out of the driver's seat right now, I can say um, because I'm not being paid by anybody or anything, it sucks. I mean, we love the sponsors and, and love doing that stuff, but I mean, we all know it gets very vanilla of doing the same thing each and every time. So to actually be able to have fun with social media is kind of cool. Yeah, we were really excited uh, when Cole Pern decided to leave NASCAR that we were going to get like un uncensored Cole Pern. We were very and his Twitter has been awesome. Like his just <laughs> the kind of stuff he's been saying and that, that he wanted to say before and couldn't is just is is awesome. I actually think he moved back up here, so good to good to have him back. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll we'll roll in like in obviously we're living in strange times and like how have you been surviving this like pandemic situation you know it's it's funny because um we were talking before the show and and really for me my my pandemic and quarantine mode started october 26 when uh, the deal happened in martinsville so i've been pretty much on shutdown mode since then because of uh you know i can't uh, the worst thing being a race car driver is that i can't drive a street car right now so i feel like i've been trapped at home anyways so i've been getting a lot of uber and lyft credits uh going around town places but uh yeah, I mean it's um, it's interesting because my um, my family they actually have a background in infectious diseases and um, you know they they were the ones working on uh, Ebola and um, H1N1 diseases so they're the ones helping uh, people get through the clinical trial process to get their um, uh, to get their vaccines through to the FDA so I'm very familiar with this process so I guess I see it in a little bit different light because I come from a family and a business that that was literally their job was to help people with influences like this. So 
um, it's kind of more intriguing for me because I get to see it from a different light of, uh, you know, 20 plus years of watching, you know, people develop vaccines and how they get it through clinical trials to the FDA and to people. So um, that's probably something that uh, that most people don't get to see. So it's been interesting getting to see that that take on things from a little bit different perspective of the government or left wing or right wing politics is just the science of, hey, how do we fix this so you know more people can survive? Yeah, it's interesting because you're you're speaking more from the the science medical side because that's the background you have. You don't care about it. These other opinions are looking at the, the clinical facts that you're presented. Yep, yep, yeah, and, and I don't have anything to do with it, but I've just seen it from you know my mom and their family, and, and they uh, they're not so much involved anymore like they used to be in those diseases because the company um, has since uh, shut down and been sold, but. Um, you know, I understand the process and they've sat on advisory boards with it. So I'm still very keyed into what's going on. And it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, just the, um, the role of, you know, it's so different today because when I was, you know, in, in school, the H1N1 deal was going on and, and all that was happening, but you didn't have Twitter or Facebook or, you know, Instagram going crazy with everything. And my God, that is the worst thing that can possibly happen for this pandemic, because I think it, I don't really think it'd be such a huge freak out in some ways. Obviously, the concerns and the things they're doing with masks and everything is, is absolutely what they should be doing. But it's still interesting to see like something, you know, we've seen in the past um, be so different on different levels because of today's social media world. It's, it's very different than what, you know, they had to deal with in the past with finding vaccines. It's so um, politicized and it's and you see it in NASCAR too. I mean, you know, you have victory lane celebrations with a mask on and nobody around anybody. But um, you know, yeah, we could we have, could write a book on that. Uh, we I, I wanted right. to get into it on Twitter, but like I'm like let's just avoid this altogether. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but it, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's like a fine line in 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 both sides of the motorsport spectrum because you have um for example like the the regional side where local short track racing you know it's starting to come back and it's getting into the swing of things, but you don't see the kind of the same practices that you would see that NASCAR is trying to set the example of by having this. And it's it's a fine line because, yeah, we all think it's funny and it's fun to poke fun at some things in the moment. We have to be lighthearted. But then we also have to be like we have to set an example with with the Cup Series to trickle yeah. down towards everything else. So, I, yeah, I, yeah, it's it's interesting because I think you have two different dynamics because the Cup Series and in all of NASCAR, you know, you have NASCAR corporate. If you look at um, Carolina Speedway or, or Merritt Speedway in Michigan and you're trying to put on a show, that's not a corporate deal. That is, you know, that's uh, a mom and pop operation. They are trying to survive for themselves and for the competitors that are running. I mean, a lot of people rely on that for an income. So you're on two totally different spectrums in there. And, and we've always talked about these last two years, the, the divide between short track and NASCAR racing. And I think that goes with the schedule and things that we're looking at, trying to bridge those back together. But definitely one of the more interesting things is that you know short tracks they want the show to go on and push things forward but nascar being on such a national scale and and under the scope of the media being on tv you know you have to be as protected as possible because if, if they get shut down it's not good news for the local short tracks at all mm -hmm. that's, that's for sure yeah we were talking about that a lot like we were really concerned like you know what would happen if somebody tested positive things like back when this first happened so for us, like James and I were both in Tampa. That's where James lives. I was going to shoot the St. Petersburg Grand Prix that weekend. And then all this happened. So I booked a flight home and we were like, is NASCAR going to cancel? You know, we didn't know. And we're like, well, optically they have to because of the last thing left, everything else canceled. So yep. and now we are where, where we are. Obviously in a very beneficial situation in the fact that it's not a sport where people, you know, sweat on each other and breathe on each other so they can... <laughs> go back racing but it does seem kind of strange that we have nascar racing but like you can't go to the gym and you can't you know it was a little weird you know but i'm, I'm glad we have it back i really am and speaking of that oh, how did you enjoy the coke 600 did you watch it i did i've watched um i've watched all of them i, I want to backtrack first before we go to the coke 600 if it's okay go for to it the absolutely awesome racing we had at Darlington. I mean, my goodness, that was freaking sweet. Like, if we're, it, it's, you know, we talk about the Coke 600, we'll get into that, but I think the racing we saw at Darlington, the return of, you know, such a historic racetrack that, you know, the NBC article has been put out of how it almost got shut down to some of the best racing between the Cup Series and Xfinity Series over these last few days. I mean, what a return 
uh, in that that was as a fan, as a driver. I mean, that's everything you want to see. So, you know, um, that's that came under a lot of stress and a lot of scrutiny. And I think they knocked it out of the park. So first off, I mean, just congrats to NASCAR and Darlington for everything they did there. And, and man, I wish I could have been a part of it because that was um, such a special thing to, to watch and see. Um, no practice ever. We should never yeah. practice. <laughs> <laughs> Every race should just be qualifying draw, no practice. You know, it's it's interesting on that point, like going into the Coke 600 um, in that conversation. You know, as a rookie last year, moving from the Xfinity Series to the Cup Series, on the Xfinity side, you know, you fly in Friday morning with the team. You have one 45-minute uh, practice. You have about a one-and-a-half to two-hour break. Then you have a 50-minute practice. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the next morning, you go in and qualify and race. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, and, and it's fine. Um, I've noticed, or I noticed last year in the Cup Series, you know, we had a practice, and then we had a day off, and, or, you know, we had a practice, and then a second practice, and then you come back the next day, and then you'd qualify, and then you had another practice, and then you do all of this, and you have 500 miles of racing. And the teams are double to triple the size of the Xfinity Series or the Truck Series. I never completely understood why we needed so much practice, and I think some of the excitement in these first stages and the things going on that we saw over these last couple of weeks has been because, well, you know, people didn't have it right. And that kind of adds, I think, a little bit of an element of surprise. And, um, you know, we, we have the favorites in these races and stuff, but you saw Darlington having that invert and, and having things, you know, happen like that. You had to see comers and goers. And, and um, I have my own opinions about this package and entire fall off and stuff that we can get into later, but um, you need that excitement and drama in there. And, um, you know, I don't I don't think we need to get rid of practice entirely. But, I mean, you know, you look at dirt racing, you look at other series, I think it's very possible to do all the Cup Series uh, shows in, in one or two day shows. You know, practice um, in the afternoon when it's near race conditions. You get an hour long session. Next day you come in the morning like Xfinity does. You uh, you qualify for two laps and you go race. I don't I don't think you need any more than that. And I think that's going to be kind of a lasting effect of the pandemic on all forms of business and everything is what's, what did we do during the pandemic that ended up being more efficient? You know what I mean? Like in NASCAR, I think we'll see that. I think a lot of businesses are also seeing, uh, you know, that there are non-essential staff they could let go of that they didn't need during cost-saving measures. And I went and donated blood and, and it was so streamlined and so safe. And they were like, I hope we always do this. You know, I think you're going to see that a lot now uh, as a lasting effect of, of the situation. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Gone are the uh, the allures of those three, four day weekends that fans used to look <laughs> forward to in like the mid and early 2000s. Like that's kind of gone. It, I agree. It, it's the streamlining of the schedule, not only just as uh, a competitor and as someone who works there for Mark and I, because we work there, but as a fan, you gotta, you gotta think they might enjoy like one less day of having hype and drama where they can just go about their lives and then they can focus on and get more excited about this event for like two days rather than try to yeah. drag it on. So, well, I think there's another part of that too. And that's, we've heard from all the people on Twitter and that's that, you know, hotel rooms are expensive, especially when you go to a Bristol or Daytona or wherever and hotels, you know, they jack up the prices for the demand. It's just a fact. And I don't think that's right size, you know, in these last few years of less attendance. But when you look at a weekend of um, these last few weekends, you don't have practice and you just go and race I think what this is kind of saying is that, hey, you know, from Ford and Chevy and, and uh, Toyota, we have these rate simulators. The drivers can prepare on there and you have less practice days. In my opinion, that should be that, well, you know, maybe we can actually throw in a few more races at some exhibition tracks or some tracks we haven't been to because you're you're not there for four A's anymore. You're, you're there for two. So if you add in, you know, five more races, but they're midweek or whatever it is, I think it's a possibility to do that because you're you're on the road either way. So you might as well make it more exciting either with more races and less practice days or whatever it may be. But, you know, that's the other part is our sport is so engineering driven that, um, you know, on the Xfinity and truck side, you don't have that as much. But on the cup side, it is so um, engineer driven that it is a very, very different world than I experienced in the Xfinity series because everything is down to, you know, the um, the 16th of Packer, that can make the difference between a fifth place car and a 12th place car of, of how that thing is traveling to the corners. And, um, you know, that's just, it's such a different world with that. 
But at the same time, we pay those guys pretty well, and if, and they should be able to have some pressure put on them, and, and they do already. But to be able to unload on the track and get that thing right, I think puts an extra element of that teamwork and uh, the sophistication behind the scenes that the drivers got to figure it out when they get in there. But also puts you know effort on the team to say, hey, we got to have our um, you know have our stuff right when we show up to the racetrack. Mm, and and I think we're we're gonna see. I, I'm hoping we see more double headers. You know, like the Pocono mm-hmm. weekend, because that that's a great way to save people money, you know, is just have two races on the same weekend, like have a race Saturday, yep. race Sunday, less practice. We can have less money in hotel rooms. Like I always thought dragging Daytona out into a week of qualifying and whatnot was always a massive waste of money. I'm like the flights, the hotels. <laughs> waste like, of money because the hotels are the seven wrecked cars per team. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like look at the clash. Like I, I was a huge, I got killed on Twitter because I said the clash was pointless and people were like, not okay with me saying that. And then we watched the clash and it was just a joke. You know, it was so bad. So many wreck cars. I'm like, good. That's what seven, 8 million in wreck race cars for no reason. Yep. I, I'm well, anti, anti exhibition races, anti all-star races. None of that. Well, I think, well, I, no, oh, go I'm ahead, sorry, man. Go. Well, the only other thing I was going to say is I think something to to Matt's point, not much of an exhibition race, but I think we've seen it already tested is the kilometer theory, putting the kilometer back at the end, shortening these races. And that's, I think, something we've really needed because when they started to shorten the races from five to 400 miles, a lot of the fans backlash at NASCAR and didn't like it. It wasn't the tradition and the old guard mentality needs to lay down a little bit and i think nascar has really taken this time to push these newer ideas and you know matt i don't know about you as a competitor what's uh what's your mindset going into a 500 mile race versus a 500 kilometer race well i think the the difference in there is that you know in a 500 mile race that there is time to if you screw up you have time to make it back up and you know the xfinity races if you look at the ALSCO 300 or whatever we just had. Well, that could be the ALSCO 500 if it's on Sunday. You know, it could be the same length. And watching that race last night, I think it was three hours or something like that. You look at baseball. You look at them, you know, uh, putting a a timer on the the pitch counts on there. You look in other sports like um, basketball when they get a rebound. It's no longer 24 seconds. It's 14 seconds. All these other sports are doing things to accelerate the game, to make it more exciting. I think when you look at a 500 kilometer race, um, or yeah, when you look at a kilometer race like that, you have a sense of urgency. You know that if you mess up, you better get it right and get it fixed quick. So those restarts mean more. Those long runs aren't as, you know, they're not there as much. But when you do have one, your car has to be right. You got to make big moves fast. And watching that Darlington race last week, you know, I thought there was all kinds of passing and things going on. And, and that intensity in there. And um, kind of going back to your question about the Coke 600, I didn't see that. I didn't see that sense of urgency. I didn't see that need to push right away because it is a 600-mile race. Now, I don't want fans to get mad at me for this because I've said on Twitter many, many times, the crown jewel races I do not think should be changed on there. There should be the Daytona 500. There should be the Coke 600. There should be the Southern 500, um, you know, the Firecracker 400. Those things should not be touched. But in the sense of a lot of these other races, they do not need 500 miles. It should be 500 kilometers, 400 kilometers, whatever it is. Because, you know, you look across the board in other sports, they're two and a half to three and a half hours long. We have a five and a half or a rain delay last night uh, or, or the other night, a six to seven hour race. I mean, my goodness, like that's. I couldn't watch the whole thing. And I did watch the last hundred laps and it still took two hours. Yeah. I stayed, <laughs> up, like. I stayed up for the whole thing. And then like it threw my whole Monday off because I got no sleep. And like, you know, I was, it was brutal. I was like, man, this sucks. I'm like either started at 3 PM <laughs> or shortened the race because it's brutal, man. Like, it was so long. Those last hundred laps was like the last two minutes of a basketball game. It just would not end. Yeah. It was just, and even the last restart, like when we got to 607 and a half miles, it was like, let's make it even longer, you know? So yeah, right. <laughs> it, it was tough. And, and, and we'll, we'll like deep diving into that Coke 600. Like I, I was very vocal on Twitter that I did not enjoy the race. I thought it was boring. Um, you know, and I was happy NASCAR was back. I was happy they were honoring the military. I thought it was great, but I'm not the kind of person that's like, I'm just happy it's back. So great. I was like, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. good. 
to me. So I didn't like it. I thought no green flag passing. Green, and we did the stats. Green flag passing was way down than it was like 10 years ago. So just just not as good. It was actually half as much green flag passing as last year, too. Yeah. And that's what I thought was strange about it, because I was a part of last year's Coke 600. Mm-hmm. And I thought there's a lot of good side by side racing. And I don't know if it's teams figuring out the package or the weather conditions, because Charlotte is a very uh, temperature sensitive track. I will say that. Um, but with that being said, yeah, um, as a competitor and as a fan watching that race, it sucked. I mean, there's there's no other way to put it, because when you listen to these cars and they're wide open the whole time and then they lift a little bit and they get back to the throttle, you know, you see it and there's just the arrow push and they slide. I mean, I had so many times last year you get behind another car and you're like, oh, I'm about to make the pass. Oh, can't do it. The car just takes off like a dump truck. So when you watch the Xfinity race, yeah, it, it's still not. I mean, it was a great race, but I don't know. If, I, I guess it goes back to the mile and a half track deal or whatever to where cars get spread out and that whole thing but um it's still at least widened out at some point you have off throttle time and, it, and you could make those passes i don't understand completely and I'm, i'll probably get some flag for it again but i'm not driving right now so i don't really care but when you have that off throttle time and you have no grip it allows the cars to slide and the corner speed to go way way down when, um, you know, last year on Fox, they showed a lot of the S&T data of the, the virtual cars overlaid over each other. And the reason the times weren't that different, or in fact, this year a little bit faster, is because that huge uh, spoiler and that high downforce package, you fly through those corners, whereas before, you just slow way down. I mean, there were times last year that we didn't even use more than 150 to 200 pounds of brake, which is just barely touching the pedal like you're thinking about coming to a red light. And that's it. Um I think that uh, when you look back, you know, a long time ago of cars sliding and slipping around, you had to use the brake, you had to get off the gas. I mean, uh, my personal favorite cars that I drove in my career were uh, the 2012-2013 cars when I got to drive for uh, Ken Schrader and the Arca Series, which were the Twisted Sister cars where you had 850, 900 horsepower, and you were driving the crap out of them. I remember going to Chicago, and you're dead sideways in the middle corner just feathering the throttle underneath somebody, and it felt like a race car, like you were on the edge of that machine losing grip. And it was fun. It was terribly hard, but it was fun. You know, that's an interesting point you bring in. And um, I, I know we could we could keep deep diving into we could We could talk about the through. package for like three hours. No problem. For three hours. We could, we could but I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll save Matt from dying on that hill because obviously he can die on that hill because we have no expertise from sitting in the race car. But uh, you talked about Ken Schrader and driving um, uh, in your early career in ARCA with Ken Schrader, uh, 2014 and 2015 specifically, what was it like driving for Kenny Schrader as a car owner? It was um, it was awesome. I mean, he was a big mentor for me, and, and uh, I wasn't 21 yet, so I didn't have a lot of uh, big party things to talk about. So, um, <laughs> but you know, I will say those were those were some of the most um, successful, but also most fun. Uh, years of my career um and my crew chief over there who's been there forever donnie richardson um such a great guy and that whole program i mean it, it's based on just old school fundamentals of um you know bringing great cars to the track not trying to overdo things and um you know i, I learned a lot of lessons um while i was there and i, I wish i wish looking back in time that uh, I, I i could have maybe stayed another year or something to really hone those and be able to go and win races you know Something interesting in my career was that I kind of got started late. I was about 12 years old when I started racing go-karts. So, you know, my climb from go-karts to NASCAR was really just in a short span of a few years. So our mentality always was, okay, once we get good at this series, if we only had so much funding. So once we got good at a series, we would jump to the next level and then get good at it to where we could compete for a win and then jump. So, you know, there's some times I look back at um, Ken Schrader racing at RCR where if I could have done it in a perfect world, yeah, I would have stayed one more year in there, but we didn't have the funding to do it, and the goal was to get to the Cup Series. So I think it's one of those, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. that, yeah, I would have liked to have done that. But at the same time, um, you know, the way we did it eventually got me to the Cup Series, and, and that was the goal. So um, I don't take it back in any way or wish I could, but um, you do, you know, kind of wonder what if I did stay in those places, maybe get categorized in, in a different way. But, um, you know, there's a lot of times we ran – 
second, third, led a lot of laps, um, you know, did a lot of good things in those races and uh, didn't close the deal. But maybe one more year in there, we start winning a lot of races and, and that changes things for me a little bit. But um, life happens. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I still made it to the Cup Series and I was very fortunate for all the opportunities I got. And, and, and not only that, but for sure, at that time, you were exposing yourself at the national level and, and gaining a, a base, starting this fan base uh, that you've grown into now and, and getting your name out there. So in, it, it's a fine line. It's very understandable. Um, but, you know, during that time when you're at Ken Schrader, you know, you mentioned you, you ran ARCA. I, I've noticed you ran a couple of K&N races, too, but you mainly ran a lot of ARCA races. Yeah. Was that more for the big track experience or was that because that national exposure? <laughs> Well, this sounds stupid now, but it's because of the big horsepower cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was um, the k races we did for sure to uh, to try to be on the NASCAR tracks. And there was definitely a plan set in place to do, you know, Pocono, Kentucky, Chicago, uh, Bristol, you know, Bristol being in the k n series, Dover, anything we could do, and New Hampshire as well, anything we could do in those years to get the NASCAR big track experience. The other part of that, though, was for sure that, um, you know, the k and cars had more of the motors that we see now in the truck and the cup series. And uh, I didn't we didn't we all didn't think at that time that that was going to cross over very well to the higher series because, you know, forever it had been that the cup series was a, um, a big motor series. And, and that was what you needed to learn. So I, I predicated myself on learning so much in those high horsepower cars that um, I probably shorted myself and had I actually had a really hard time transitioning to trucks and the cup cars because I felt like I was very strong in the um, higher horsepower cars. So I felt more comfortable with the Xfinity cars, um, with the Arca, you know, big motor cars. So it took me, you know, half a year really in both the truck and cup series cars to adapt to that with that momentum style racing. So, um, but yeah, that all went back to, hey, we're going to, we're going to try to do it like what the cup cars do and put me in some big horsepower cars. And as soon as we get there, let's take the horsepower down out of these things. <laughs> so, so you're talking, you're talking about like coming up and you kind of like, you kind of just like killed like six of our questions there in like one paragraph. But uh, so coming up through the series, something I really wanted to ask, especially a young driver like yourself, out, there's like just this disconnect on, on Twitter where, people automatically label a driver as bad because they were in a good car and they didn't win in their first five races. So you, you never had an opportunity to win a race at, you never what opportunity, you never won a race at JGR or at RCR. So what is it like to be a trash driver, Matt? Cause you never won, you know? Yeah. You know, you're yeah. so bad. You never won. Like you definitely didn't have, you're, you're boatloads of top fives or anything but you know yeah you know i i cry myself to sleep every night over it that's that's really what i do it's it's the <laughs> dumbest thing ever like honestly that belief system like it's so stupid it, well, it is like i don't know how you're a bust because like you're not you you made it to the top you made it you know what's what's funny about that um i hear i i through my career i saw a lot of about you know my career I, I suck whatever and you know it's it's funny because when i look back to my 2015 xfinity debut with jgr there's a late race caution in that i was running second to ryan blaney and we were running equal lap times i was actually a little bit quicker running him down i had a terrible and i mean terrible last restart there that i finished 10th with and that was just a rookie moment in there um but in that race you know i was uh, we ran top 10 most of the race, and here we come, 10 to go. I'm running second, running down the leader. So in my first race in that car, it's like, okay, things are going pretty good here. Then 2016, we had a lot of top fives in there. Um, you know, had some had some really good runs. My Richmond race there, there's a late race um, restart where I think Eric Jones and somebody else got together, and we got clipped in it. But that whole race, I think we finished second. in. This was the heat race era of the Xfinity uh, series. But um, ran second and third in that, ran top five almost the whole race. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of moments in there. Uh, and even going later into the season, you know, we we really ran top five most of that whole time. And then um, I think a lot of it comes from 2017. And I don't know exactly what happened um, in there. I, it took me a little bit longer than I thought to adjust to uh, my new team. Um, and, and, you know, when you take a look behind the curtains in there, we had – 
a, a rookie driver and myself. We had a brand new package in the Xfinity series. We had some newer engineers. There's a spotter that I'd never worked with. And these aren't excuses. I, I was a rookie too and made some mistakes. Um, but I'll say that it was easy for me to come back in 2016 for my brain tumor and my brain surgery stuff there because I was so fired up and had so much going for me at that time. When everything calmed down and kind of settled down in 2017, it took me a while to get back in the right headspace to be competitive because I think so many life events had happened in there of having brain surgery, of being told I wouldn't drive a race car again, that it took me a little bit to get my groove back and to get back in the swing of things. And um, if you look at my second half of 2017, we, we made the climb. I think we were like five points out of making the final four at Homestead. If we, you know, halfway through that race, we were one of the final four cars going to Homestead. So, um, you know, uh, getting the pole, uh, it been almost, you know, having a chance to win at Road America, getting the pole at Road American RCR, uh, in 2018, again, having a shot at the final four. Yeah. The final execution wasn't there, but you know, you look at a guy like Austin Sindrick and I can kind of compare my career a little bit to his because, you know, he's been developing in that same path and now you see him starting to win races. You know, I feel like if I had another, no, but year, he sucks too. Cause he only wins on road courses. That's yeah, yeah, says. You're right. no, yeah. You're, he passed Kyle Busch last night on a restart with 35 lap older tires, but he's a bust too. Like it's just, it's just you know, I, all I can say from all this stuff is that I know what I'm capable of. I know what I can do inside a race car, but you have a lot of people that wish they're in that position, and the only way they can take it out is being a, a you know a cider bully behind a keyboard. And you know what? If you're that great on it. Why don't you go get in that car and you go win that race? You go do this stuff. I mean, we're not in this in this position for you know for no reason. I mean, it's either we performed, we brought the right sponsorship deal, whatever it was to to stay in there. It's a lot of work that goes in in the background. And um, for those people in there, eventually, at first, I, it kind of frustrated me, but at the end, I just found it funny because it's like you know what? You're sitting in your couch and you're angry, pissed off, tweeting at somebody you've never met in your life, and here I am, you know, racing in the Daytona 500. So, you know, pretty much just the Chase Elliott gift from last week to them. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a that was a great one. Um, one thing I want to segue into is uh, your background. You uh, did attend UNC. Uh, Charlotte, um, and you were majoring in business management. Uh, According to Wikipedia, uh, is that true? <laughs> and, 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 and that Kentucky race. So did you finish your degree and did you major in, in business management? So I did not. And the reason I didn't was because um, I was going through the whole program and basically it kind of took a turn to when I came back in 2016, my doctor said, hey, you have you know, this much mental capacity of stress to be able to do something with, like you got to pick either go full on with racing or full on with the college thing, like pick one or the other. So of course I went down the racing path. Um, but you know what though, the, uh, the business management program there, it, uh, it helped me a lot in the sponsorship, um, whole aspect of my career. And really, I think what kept me going longer than I probably should have been there and got me to the cup series and things like that was our relationships we had with, uh, with, uh, sponsors and companies in there you know we brought some really interesting players into that nascar uh, sponsor pool we had dollar shave club and they're put on one of the coolest programs where they brought um we had this idea for them to sponsor the car and bring in 500 small businesses onto our race car at homestead in phoenix um well they the promotion started at homestead but then the following year in 2018 and phoenix 500 would be featured within 60 minutes of that race we had over 3,000. Uh, small businesses try to be a part of that and actually crash the website trying to do that. So, you know, we had a lot of out of the box marketing ideas. We worked with Ron John surf shop um, to do some really cool cars uh, in, in the Xfinity and cup series and um, Maui Jim, another partner we had in there, we, you know, we had so many cool partners that we brought in, but honestly, my favorite part aside from driving in the races uh, was going into those uh, sponsor uh, board meetings and boardrooms trying to come up with, Hey, how can we take this and create ROI for your company? And, you know, nowadays it's hard because uh, companies, it's not like the early 2000s where they want their logo on there. They don't care. They want to see social uh, media numbers go up. They want to see sales go up. And you have to deliver on that, whether it's business to business or, um, or with that social engagement. So we had to get really creative. And one of my favorite parts was that people didn't see was Monday through Friday. I was on that creative marketing team and sponsor call team of, hey, how do we bring in sponsors? How do we 
you know, curate business for them. And uh, there's a lot that goes behind it that, you know, on Saturday and Sunday, yeah, I was a race car driver, but Monday through Friday, I was a salesman and a marketing guy. So speaking of marketing, so you drove for uh, Red Horse Racing right before they shut down. Now, mm -hmm. they are the king of the unsponsored truck. Like they are just, they've been running unsponsored trucks forever. Did they have a marketing department or no? You know, it I'm not seems, seems like they didn't. <laughs> so, um, you know, over at, at, uh, Red Horse, they, um, they, they definitely had some folks that were working on sponsor pitches for them and they had a, a great PR team there. Um, you know, every team has its own philosophy with it there. And I, I can't specifically remember what their situation was because I was only there part time. So um, I don't remember them exactly having that. But I, I know they had people that were working on trying to get sponsorship for them. Um, the other thing I'll say is finding um, sponsorship, even the Cups series, but especially the Truck and Xfinity series, is, uh, is about as easy as finding a needle on a haystack. Like, it sucks. Um, because when you have those calls, it's, well... So are you are you NASCAR? Like yes, we're the NASCAR Truck Series, NASCAR Xfinity Series. Okay, so so if we do this, does that mean you're in NASCAR? It's like, oh my gosh! Like yeah. I, oh yeah, I know. Cool. Yeah, I know we've exactly all been there. What you mean, man? Like you, you should like we work in IMSA. You try and sell that to people. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. the, the reality of it yeah. is. If you really looked at uh, if you looked at the truck series and the Xfinity series, and yes, Red Horse had a blank truck, but if you didn't have family companies on there, and if you didn't have Toyota Care on the trucks or Ford Performance on the cars and trucks, three quarters of the field would be blank. Yeah, hundred percent true. And 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 you and you mentioned to to that point and 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 how you built relationships up with these uh, partners through time. What were like some of the you know clutch moments where you had to find a sponsor and then you didn't think it was going to happen. And then next thing you know, 13th hour phone rings or just something just comes together. What were what, some of those moments like? I mean, I think the, the dollar shave club one was definitely one in there and, and unfortunately it didn't turn into anything bigger. And, and one of the things people don't realize is you can hit on something and that works and it works and it works. And then you have somebody at the top and they change CEO or they change their CFO, CFO or their chief marketing officer. And you have this great plan and they don't understand what racing is. Well, time to get rid of it. I mean, I don't know what happened with, with Lowe's and Jimmy Johnson, but, you know, you look at something like that or, you know, Brad Keselowski, on the, um, he wins the Coke 600 and saying, hey, this is their one race they got all year. I don't know if they'll be back. And you think Miller Lite and NASCAR, like that goes together like peanut butter and jelly, you know? So um, I think for us, there was a few moments in there for sure, um, like that dollar, excuse me, the Dollar Shave Club deal. Um, when we're at RCR, having Next Year on there, they were a big company for us out of uh, Michigan, which was uh, kind of cool because they had Dow uh, sponsoring Austin Dillon and their plant for next year was like 10 minutes down the road. So that was a big one for us. Um, shoot, I'm trying to think of some other ones we had. I mean, we've had so many. And the the good and bad part of these deals has been we had so many one-off deals because it was hard to sell more than just one or two race packages. So um, we had a lot of paint schemes and I mean a lot of paint schemes. Yeah, that, that's becoming more uh, and more prevalent now. Like yeah. that's everyone. That's just the reality now. Well, and it's it's an interesting thing because people say on, you know, on social media, well, I don't know who to cheer for because it used to be the Home Depot car and it used to be the Lowe's car and you used to have the, you know, the DuPont car and and I don't know who to I don't know who to follow anymore. Well, that's because it costs so much and you have to find different sponsors because for them, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for them to pay for a billboard or, you know, on the highway, let alone a billboard on the racetrack anymore. So, you know, you find those rare sponsorships and you cling on to them as much as you can. And I think one of the best groups that does it, even though I just mentioned them with Miller Lite, but you look at someone like Roger Penske and the Pennzoil relationship he has and the Alliance Truck Parts, um, you know, I, and I've never even driven for Penske, but you just look at guys like that that, uh, you know, they really do a great job with that. And even uh, at Front Row Motorsports, where we had Love's Travel Stops, I mean, just a, a natural fit with um, some of Bob's trucking companies that he owned on the side. And, um, you know, there's there's so many fits you have to find. But, my gosh, without that owner piece in there and the business-to-business the business piece, it is so hard to do. So my hope is that NASCAR, with these different ideas and different cultivating of, of racetracks and schedules and all this, that we can create – 
an affordable place to where if a, a sponsor comes with ten or twenty thousand dollars, that that can be a full sponsor, not have to be a hundred twenty, hundred fifty grand to be able to foot the bill for these cars. Oh, yeah, that's true. You know, and that you know brings more players into into NASCAR, and more fans want to be there. And it was interesting. There was a Twitter question someone was asking, and I believe they were a marketing person. They were asking just as a poll if NASCAR fans still bought products that were associated with NASCAR, because that was always a one of the biggest hype tools. Marketing classes. Two thirds of NASCAR fans will buy a product that's associated with the sport, yeah. and it, it it's big because of the psychological effect. But that's been ever changing, and with almost every race, there's a new product on a car. It's hard sure. for fans to open up their wallet. So, you know, to that too, how do you how do you kind of attract fans with what you're doing to be on your side and to believe in these companies and your word? Because you're like you said, you're the pitchman, you're the sales guy. Yeah, you know, it's hard. Um, I would say one of them, um, this is something that I've, I've uh, put out a post about before. Um, we've, and is a personal story to me because I'm and I'm a user of CBD because of my brain stuff I've gone through and the seizures I've had. It's an anti-epileptic um, thing. It's totally natural. You can buy it in the States. Um, but, you know, there's things like that that for me, it's a perfect fit because it helps with anxiety, helps with my inflammation. And, you know, after races, you take uh, Tylenol or um, Advil or whatever, and it's things that hurt your liver that are, and you know, you have beer sponsorship and all this stuff going on. And to me, you know, that was an area that it is a booming market, and we have such a chance to grasp onto something. I have a personal story with that. Well, we had a full pitch and everything, but unfortunately, in there, NASCAR has a block on it that they block CBD companies from coming into the sport, and right or wrong or whatever their views on it are. It's hard with that. And you look back a few years, you know, you had Verizon wanting to enter the sport. Well, it's NASCAR Sprint Cup Series, so Verizon couldn't come in. So I think as a sport, too, we need to be a little bit less restrictive on things like that because we do have people that want to play. We do have people that want to be in there. But you have only so many people that want to sponsor a NASCAR. And when you block out even more of those people, that list becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think that's an ask that I would have of, um, you know, of Steve Phelps and uh, some of the NASCAR uh, teams, you know, that work in corporate uh, in, in Daytona Beach to say, hey, if we have a sponsor, as long as this, this is not, you know, some explicit material, let's let it be there. You know, if we can have beer and we can have, um, we used to have extends on cars. I mean, my gosh, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, if we can do that stuff, I feel like there's some other things that, that should have probably been allowed on these race cars. Yeah, I know this isn't the Joe Rogan experience, but we uh, we, we would endorse CBD straight up because it's uh, it's good for you in in many ways and facets. Uh, my mother has Parkinson's, so she's always a uh, she's always on a high form of CBD just to help her calm and stimulate her muscles well. But you know, it, it's a shame because we've heard of stories like guys like Stan Barrett who have tried to bring on and yep. they get axed. And for a guy like Stan. He's bringing money to a smaller team that could hopefully fund another young and up-and-coming driver in the, down the line, but that team gets axed. It's a yep. trickle effect, like you're saying. That there's a whole economy to this. Well, it is, and you know, when you have a situation where you know it got pushed back a year, but you're asking the teams in 2022 to spend you know millions upon millions of dollars to force on a new car. If you have a sponsor that wants to spend millions, but you're saying no to them, that that's kind of a weird situation to me. So. Um, I'm not going to try to get too much into this, and I should probably shut up about it. But yeah, we'll, we'll, um, yeah, yeah, we'll move. But, we'll move on from that. Yeah. We'll move on. It's been a good conversation, but, though. No, but but I do think at the end of the day that there are people. There really are people um, that should be allowed into sponsoring NASCAR. And the truth of the matter is that that fans do latch on to those drivers' promotional products. You know, I think Coke is one of the best ones that does it with the Coca-Cola family of drivers. And you still see the in-store activation, Mobile One with Clint Boyer and Kevin Harvick and those commercials and Geico with Ty Dillon. I mean, there are people who do a great job of it. And uh, hopefully we can keep on building that and, and make that a mainstay for almost every driver in the series because we all need that funding. And if we can't find the funding, we got to lower the cost somehow. Definitely. And and you mentioned, so you, so we'll shift gears here. So you mentioned the, the, the Gen, was it Gen 7 car? Do you care that it only has one lug nut? Good. Good to hear that. Glad to hear that you are a free thinking person who admits that having five lug nuts is not a hill to die on. So move, moving <laughs> along. Um, so you, you talked about like when you moved up to cup and whatnot, that you, the, the goal was to get the cup series. That's every driver's goal, unless you're Matt Crafton. Um, it's everyone else's goal to get to the cup series. 
So when you finally decided to make that jump, it was Front Row Motorsports. Like obviously not the most competitive team. Like they're getting there. Like man, John Hunter with a top 10 at Darlington. I think that was only their fifth top 10 in team history that was not at Daytona or Talladega. So pretty crazy to see them. Like they're starting to look a lot better now. Maybe the package has helped them. I don't know. Maybe it has, you know, put the field closer together. But what was it like, you know, go, knowing you were going to go to a team that would not be as competitive? Yeah, it was um, it was different because you had to learn um, in the first quarter of the year. I had to learn a totally different way of racing, and that wasn't that you're racing for the win or top ten anymore. You raced for the stages. Excuse me. And what I mean by that is you race to be on the lead lap because if you were not on the lead lap at the end of the stage, you were going to go a lap down, obviously. But then the next stage, that puts you two laps down. And then in the final stage, that you get a wave around probably one time, but you still end up being two laps down. Well, now you're looking 25th to 30th. If you can stay one lap down, you're looking 20th to 25th. If you can stay in the lead lap, well, you know, anything's a possibility. So, you know, I take a look at our Indianapolis race. You just mentioned John Hunter's great job he did at Darlington. We were running 11th and 12th that whole race because we stayed on the lead lap. We did a good job with our pitch strategy. We had a fast car. And, you know, looking at that race, we got wrecked by Daniel Suarez to try to make the chase because of whatever. was not very happy about that. Because the playoff um, format. Yeah. 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 Um, but so we got wrecked by him for a place in there. But we ran 11th or 12th on that whole day because we stayed in the lead lap. David Reagan, the Coke 600 last year, I think he finished 12th in a front row car because he was able to either get a wave around at one point or whatever. He got back you learn this total thing of you're not necessarily racing the people around you. You're racing the clock and the clock is the leader. So you got to position yourself to build as much of a buffer with the cars around you. And that buffer and that strategy with your pit strategy and everything else like that makes it to where you're racing the clock rather than the other cars around you as much, which is a totally different way of thinking because you're still racing them. But if you're in the front, you can go door to door, side draft the crap out of each other. And it's fine, but if you do that back there and you cost yourself three quarters of a second to the leader, well, now you just lost 10 laps of the buffer that you just had. So it's such a different way of thinking. Wow. Never really, that's actually a really interesting way to look at it. Like, that's, yeah. that's you're opening our eyes to being in the mid pack <laughs> because no one knows that, you know, and these are what, these are the kind of things either. we wanted to have you on for, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a new way to look at this race. Like, you know, when you see that ticker flip by and you're looking at 20th through 30th, that's a whole nother race right there in, in, yep. in the grand scheme of things. It's crazy to think about the, the time constraints. Um, yeah. You mentioned the wave around. How, how many times has uh, the caution come out and you had to be the wave around and you can't come around and pit and you are going to restart on those older tires and you know it's you're not going to be near the same pace as the leaders and you're trying to, like yeah. you said, minimize the time lost per lap? Yeah. It's um, it's a it's a it's very much an art, and I look at guys like Ty Dillon, Corey LaJoy. You know, these guys have been doing it for a few years, and they're really really good at it. Mike McDowell, my teammate over there, he was really good at it, and it goes mainly to the crew chief and the spotter to say, okay, well, if we have if we have 15 laps, yeah, we can probably do it and get away with it. Um, if we have a 50 lap run and we we don't need fuel in there. Well, we're probably not going to make it, you know, without going a lap down in there. So you play the game of, OK, if I'm a lap down right now and I come pit and get tires, am I going to, you know, go two laps down because I'm too slow anyways? Or you play the game of, OK, I'm within three tenths of a second, so I'm going to get a wave around. I'll be slower, but I'll end up cycling to be one lap down instead of pitting, getting tires feeling good. But I end up going two laps down because I'm going to lose a lap anyway. So um, it's not a great feeling. But at the same time, you know that if you can keep pace and uh, suck up in the draft or do whatever you need to do in there, that you have a chance to be a lap ahead and jump that lap. So, again, it is such a game and an art back there um, that really took me a long time to learn. But once you get it, it's kind of fun because you're uh, you're really chasing the clock rather than you are the other positions. That's you know that like that gif of like Zach Galifianakis with the math going around him. That's what I feel like right now. That's what's happening to me. Yeah, that's all. See, that that's actually now relating more to like James and I working in sports cars. That's very similar to like what happens in sports cars in like a six hour yep. race or or a ten hour race of you know it's all about pit strategy and and where are we going to cycle through and because there's very little like you know you you could be in a sports car for a stint and never see another car. 
So sure. it's, yeah, not, it it's not like NASCAR. And that, that kind of segues me to asking you about road course racing. So I discuss a lot on my Twitter about road course racing. I love road course racing. I, I love NASCAR. Sports cars are my favorite type of racing. I yeah. love road courses. Are, would you be okay if, say, NASCAR did like six road courses a year in Cup? Yes, but with a low down force pack. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, they can't they can't run like the current package and, and have any sort of fun yes. on a road course. What about no. a street? No. What about a street circuit? Would you be okay with a street circuit? 100 percent. Go watch the Pinty series races, dude. I think in Toronto. Um, yep. I, I think not, they did it there. Maybe they did. just just got canceled. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. well, sorry. No, I I think they should. I think you look at a place like Chicago, where I don't know what's going on there, but I think you look at a city like that, Miami. Um, there's other cities too. We should be at the circuit of the Americas track. We don't, we don't need to go to Texas twice. Sorry, Eddie Gossage, but whatever. We don't need to go through twice. Um, you know, there are so many opportunities to bring NASCAR to a different fan group and a different experience in there. And, um, you know, honestly, street racing, road course racing, we should be at, um, you know, we, we should be at circuit of the Americas. We should be going to, um, Oh, gosh. Uh, Laguna, I couldn't think of the name. Laguna Seca, we should be going there. You know, uh, Sonoma and Watkins Glen, they're great. They're fine. The Roval's cool. But we should be on more proper road courses. And at the same time, we should do it like Indy where we go to street courses. We should go to St. Pete. I mean, why not? Like, they can go and put on a great show. And they don't even touch each other. And, I mean, they do sometimes. But imagine NASCAR is going in there beating, banging the crap out of each other. Um, I think it would be some of the most fun racing. I think we should go back to Montreal. Um, I love the fact that the Xfinity Series goes to Mid-Ohio and Road America. I mean, some of the greatest racetracks. Because the reason they're, they're so great is because they are not made for stock cars. And that is what makes it fun. <laughs> I agree with you, man. Like, honestly, like, could you imagine the marketing around NASCAR if they did, like, you know, Let's just throw something other like Long Beach. Like, say they went to Long Beach and raced on the on the street circuit. Just e even like I went to the Toronto Indy last year, first time I'd ever gone, and I've lived here my whole life. And I went, and you hear the cars, and people are interested. They come, they walk down. Fan day Friday is free. Anyone can come in and watch practice, and those people come back. You know, it's you have casual people just wander down who live in the neighborhood, live in Liberty Village, just like this up and coming millennial neighborhood. And that's where the races are. And they go and they see it. They check it out. Maybe they come back. It's a it's it's a slam dunk, a street street race. It is. Well, and even look at, you know, the, the Indy 500. I know it's not a uh, it's not a road course that we're talking about here, but you have so many people that go to the snake pit. They don't care about the race, but they go to the snake pit. And yes, I know that we have every Kenny Chesney and Kid Rock concert at every NASCAR track, but go pay, go pay Kelvin Harris to be at a racetrack in the infield. Go pay Taylor Swift to do something like that. Get, and don't do it on a Thursday night of the weekend. I know they do that for the Brickyard 400, and it pisses me off. Nobody cares. Do it during the middle of the race inside the track. You, all of these places are gigantic. Like, do it somewhere in the middle. You can still hear stuff and just play the concert inside of there. It would bring at least, I mean, at least 10 of them out of, you know, hundreds of thousands got to be interested in the race. If you get 10 fans out of that, who cares? I mean, you're not getting them right now sitting at home. So uh, you're still going to get the ticket sales and everything. So I think, yes, we should do the street courses. We should do the road courses. But at the same time, at the big tracks we have now, there's more activation and things that other leagues are doing like IndyCar, where you bring outside interest in there. You don't need to have a country concert every track you go to. Agreed, man, 100%. I think we got to kill the the country music in NASCAR. Let's just let's just get that out of there. No, and... I, I want to go that far. I want to go that <laughs> No, there's there's still a great correlation of why the two go together because there's I get a lot that. of problems. But there should be a couple events where you bring in other people to try to spark new fans. Uh, only a couple times that you don't lose your roots. I mean, we went down that path with the, this whole mile and a half thing in different cities. Don't lose your roots in there. But have a couple of cool events that do bring in new people, too. We'll just have less boyfriend country in NASCAR. Yeah. More, more real yeah. country. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, Ryan speaking Blaney. of activation. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you finish. Sorry about that. No, I was just saying Ryan Blaney would like that, too. Oh, uh, <laughs> I didn't know that about Blaney. I'm, I'm just learning things about country music. One thing I got to ask you is about Midway, because you've been a driver in the Midway. And and you, and, and just talking about your um, knowledge of a, a fan experience, you know, we all know that fans can't go to the track now. But from Mark and I's experience, just at a couple of NASCAR races that we were at last year, the Midway was very lackluster. Like, it wasn't as popping as it used to be. Um, 
when you yeah, went out, well, we to were do, at where were we? We were at Texas, and, it, and Texas. even even Homestead. We were walking around Homestead, and we're like, "Where is everyone? There's nobody yeah. there." It was. And sad. you've been out doing a, appearances for Ford Performance. You know what? What? What was? What's the midway like? Does it like get really popping at the beginning of the season and just kind of trickles off towards the end, or? No, it's um. I could get off on another tangent here. Okay, so go for it. Uh, go for it. We love oh, it. Oh man. So when I was little, the, the whole reason I became a NASCAR driver was because in 2003, my dad took me to my first NASCAR race at Homestead. So we're talking about the same place here. Okay. And I remember we'd go to all the souvenir trailers. And why did they ever get rid of them? I'm so glad they got them back. But my gosh, what a dumb idea to get rid of that. Anyways, um, we used to be able to go around and do um, – they had slot car races there. The Fireball Speedway, you could go do that, so it felt like you are actually racing. They had – remember, DirecTV was sponsoring Boyer, and you could do the um, – it was one of those NASCAR video games that you see at Dave & Buster's. And was, if you got the top speed on that, you won a die-cast car at the end of the day. It was autographed by them or whatever. There hmm. were so many games, so many things to do. There's the the Army when they were sponsoring Joe Nemechek and Mark Martin. Uh, they had a, a tire, um, it was like a pit stop challenge thing. Same thing. It made it feel like a fair and like a, a whole other event because people are showing up four hours be- before the race and they just sit there and go, okay, when's the race? And I think, yeah, I know you have like a little concert on the front stretch or whatever, but compared to when I was a kid from 2003 to 2007 or so, it was awesome to go on the midway. And you had people lined up. I remember seeing a Casey Kane trailer he was signing autographs and that thing went it seemed like for a mile for people to go in because the place was packed everyone wanted an autograph and i feel like we've gotten and i i will say i never had a motorhome or anything um when i was driving but i I think the problem is that you have guys that are so comfortable being in their motorhome they don't want to go out and experience in the fans and at the same time yeah we have the ford stage we have the xfinity stage and they do a good job with that but nobody else wants to play with it because of the cost to do it and Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that goes back to that is the cost of you know being there the tracks things with that i think it goes to if the tracks want to promote this thing they need to put out an effort to have a fan experience in the midway and uh it's just it's not there what it used to be and so i think you know you, you go to an nfl game you have the whole tailgating sections you have all this stuff going on there's parties going on you have, like the bills mafia thing like they got people jumping on tables not saying we need people to jump on tables oh, i've seen but, it in person it's great <laughs> we need we yeah. need backyard wrestling matches in <laughs> yeah. in the midway, right? I mean, yeah, definitely. Well, what they have yeah. the, what is it the recliner racing at Daytona? We saw that. It was like, yeah. yeah. But you know, you have a partner in barstool sports now with NASCAR, right? So why mm-hmm. not the barstool midway? Why not do it with the beer companies that are involved in NASCAR? You know, you need to hype up something. You go to you go to Universal, um, the Universal Park in, in Orlando, and just walking around, there's always things to do partner up with those entertainment companies to make some sort of an experience out of it because you guys are right like the people aren't there and at the end of the day they always preach this is supposed to be entertainment it's supposed to be entertaining racing that's why we have this whole 550 horsepower package well why don't you make the race day entertaining too beforehand and i think they some companies really try but the activation is not there what it used to be and i know it's because funds are tough and and the money's not there anymore but the tracks and uh, the tracks, I, I don't know if it's their fault necessarily, but NASCAR, especially now that it's privately held, really needs to put in an effort with entertainment for the race to make it seem like this big hyped up event. And, and no, I is, agree. And, and sorry, James, this is where like, again, like I bring up the IMSA thing because like when you go to an IMSA race, there's like seven support series. You have racing all day. There's mandatory driver autograph sessions that every fan can attend, get an autograph. You can walk through the garage on a basic GA ticket. Like at the Rolex 24 this year, you pay a hundred bucks for four day pass. You walk through the garage and you could happen to run into Kyle Busch or Juan Pablo Montoya and get their autograph. You know, and that's things that you don't see at a NASCAR race. Now I get it. If they let everyone into the garage at a NASCAR race, you already can't move with people walking around with $500 hot passes. You already have nowhere to go. So I, it would be well, ridiculous, but. I will say on that though, in the truck series and Xfinity series, almost every race we had a mandatory autograph session underneath the grandstands. And I don't know if in Iowa always does it. So I don't know if it's just a cup series ego thing or whatever it is, but I will say after every race weekend, almost every race weekend when I was with surface um, sunscreen, they would have me go out, sign stuff at the haulers. There's videos of me signing stuff for people out there. So I tried to make an effort and do that thing. But you know, for myself as a rookie and as a young driver, 
how do you make your name if nobody knows who you are and you're not allowed to go access the fans outside? I mean, it's a strange deal. And I think you saw, you know, guys like Corey LaJoy who go sit there in grandstands and, and go sign stuff for people. I mean, there's some of us in the back that are doing that. But, you know, Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, Kyle Busch, you know, those guys, go do something like that. You know, our sport needs it. We are in a big turning point in not only in NASCAR, but also in the entertainment world to where we're coming up on the TV contract. We're coming up on all these big things. We need fans. We need to survive. And the way we survive is the big names. And if they don't want to do anything, if they just want to play Xbox or watch a movie in their in their you know million dollar motorhome, that's fine. But you might not have something to be around here in a few years. No, and it's crazy because to circle it all back, if you think about it, with every sponsor coming in and out, you don't have association with the car. All you have is the driver. So the casual fans kind of out the window, out the window. unless the driver is that interesting to grab onto by everybody. So it's all about the driver. And if they don't push themselves, then how are we going to promote the sport? Yeah. But there are yeah. a lot of drivers with no personality that have a lot of sponsorships. <laughs> so is that true? true. Yeah. Well, and, and that goes back to the owners. I think they do a good job or the marketing teams to do a good job. And, and you know, you see how popular someone like Kyle Busch, I mean, everybody loves to hate Kyle Busch, but you know what? He's out there in the campground signing stuff for people out there. So there are people even like him as as loved or hated as he is, that is doing things for the fans. And you know, so there are people like him that do get it, but I think it should be a call upon everybody to put in that same amount of effort to do those things and make those unique experiences. But yeah, I, I, you're right. There are people that don't have personalities that do have these big sponsorships, but it either goes to connections that their teams have made or they've made that you see in the background. But I think it goes back to what I said in the beginning of this podcast is it is hard to be yourself because you are told what to say by these companies. And if you don't say what you want to say with it, then you get in trouble. I mean, you can have a conservative company that says, well, if you go on the air and say hell or damn or whatever, then you're done. It's like, well, I'm not going to risk $10 million to pay for my racing to, you know, because that's what it costs to run a car. I'm not going to risk saying that on TV and get, you know, get the boot out of this deal. I mean, you're, you're not going to. So, it's a very hard balance, and I wish it wasn't so hard with that. No, oh, man, you're giving us like such great insight just into into what it's like, man. We got to talk to more drivers who aren't racing right now, so they can give us their real <laughs> opinions. <laughs> no, it's great, man. Like we have some fan questions though. They're they're uh, yeah. some more some more like super like softball questions. So you can give me hardball. Too, so so, so so the first one is from is from Stephen X Stephen Kemp on Twitter, and he says. What's it like, obviously this is pretty self-explanatory, but what's it like watching races knowing that you can't be out there and he says hopefully you're 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 progressing and hopefully you'll be back soon. Yeah, it's um it's hard because you know I don't have a timeline right now. I don't have a set date of when I can be back. You know, when I was with the the as crazy as this sounds, the brain tumor deal was a lot easier to deal with than the seizure stuff. So um, because at least that was like a known cause and, and everything. So we're trying to figure out what the cause is with this thing. But um, it's tough because you know, or I know that I should be out there. And, and the hard part too about it is, um, I don't know if this, I, I think I've talked about it before, so I don't think I'll get in trouble. But, you know, I had, um, the week before it all happened, I had a signed contract with Front Row to be back again the next year. So um, that, that's the hard part is knowing that I should be out there and I should be doing these things and I can be doing these things. But um, I think at the same time, it allows me to see things from an outside perspective, to be a fan a little bit. Um, but also, you know, life does go on in different ways. And like I mentioned, you know, my wife, she's starting up her own storefront. So I've been able to be a part of that, which I wouldn't have been able to do. Um, and, and so there's things in different aspects in life that I have enjoyed. But I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that I don't miss racing because I miss racing a ton. And uh, I can't wait for when I can get back out there in whatever capacity it is. But um, you know, it's, it's tough, but at the same time, um, I'm a fan of, of racing and NASCAR. So I'm not just going to shut that part of my life out because I thoroughly enjoy sitting there and watching great finishes specifically so far in the Xfinity series. But, um, but you know, it's, it's fun to watch these things and know the strategy that's going on and, and being a part of all three series now. And, and like I told you guys about the back marker stuff or the middle of the pack cars, there's so much that goes on that it's, it's kind of cool to see now from a fan rather than Monday quarterback. Oh, that's good. That's a good way to look at it. Um, the next one is, uh, uh, well, we just talked, uh, do you have a timeline when you'll be back? Obviously we do not. Uh, so would, would going back to cup right away. So Jeremy Bach asked, would, would a 
going back to Kelp right away be an option for you, or do you think you're going to have to go back down to Trucks or Xfinity? Don't know completely yet. Um, I think a lot of it rides on sponsorship and availability. Uh, the other part of it too is we, you know, everybody really doesn't know what's going to happen with this 2022 um, Gen 7 deal. So I would say it's not really realistic for me to say that, you know, I, I don't even know if I'll run in 2021 at all. Um, hopefully some some smaller stuff in there to get my feet back wet and get things going again. Um, I don't even know what I have to do yet to get cleared to get back racing. So there's a lot of unknowns even in there for me to know that. Um, but with that being said, at the same time, you know, looking at 2022, I think there's a big transition year there for budgets and knowing what you need for sponsorship and what the state of the sport with schedules and everything looks like. So for the Cup Series specifically, I wouldn't say that I'd go back full time anytime sooner than 2023, just because I don't know what it costs to run it. I don't know what you need to pitch for sponsors, and I don't know what the revenue share and TV deal, all that stuff. There's so many dominoes to fall, and the charter system, you know, goes through 2024. What happens after that? You know, we don't know. So there's a lot of pieces in there um, that you know we don't know what's going to happen yet, and I think it all be for the good, but. Um, kind of need to know a little bit better idea to try to stake my future um, in the sport and strategize like I did before, but strategize again now coming back. So uh, a good softball after that great response. <laughs> um, what do, uh, Don wants to know, like when you were racing, what kind of music would you listen to before the race? Did, did you pump yourself up or were you like, uh, like, I don't know, maybe like some Dido or something like just get chill before you get in the car? <laughs> you know, um, I uh, I never listened to music before I got in the car, but will I? What I will say is um, this was really interesting to me. Uh, I was at an event in the uh, Dominican a couple years ago. We had a similar sponsor in Brain Gear that uh, David Ortiz worked with. So his um, retirement party, I got to go down there, and uh, I got to meet um, Ellie Raisman, the Olympic uh, gymnast. And one of the things that she told us was that the um, Chinese uh, gymnast team, you know, they were obviously one of the top competitors for the United States. And they'd listen to, you know, really hyped up, pumped up music, getting them going, going crazy, like just getting getting psyched for it. And they said for the U.S. team, they'd listen to classical music. They'd listen to some slow country, like just very zoned in music. And I was like, wow, that's that's really interesting. And so I actually worked with at the end of 2017, the second half of the year there after um, actually right before Road America, where we had that great finish with uh, Jeremy Clemens there. I uh, started working with a sports psychologist and um, we talked about just breathing exercises, meditation um, and this whole uh, basically just kind of seeing your future. I'm losing the word right now, but um, just kind of like a uh, gosh, what is that? I can't remember. But visualizing. It, yeah, visualize. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. So just visualization practices in there. So clearly I'm out of practice right now, apparently. But, uh, but you know, we go through those visualization practices and it just be like that deep uh, concentration. And I remember the first times I did it and I'd be walking through to the, um, uh, to the uh, driver intro stage and people would be signing and taking pictures and stuff. And I wouldn't remember any of it. It was just like I was in this floating cloud zone and, um, uh, you know, one weird thing of, of NASCAR is that you go sit up there with 39 people that you're going to go compete against and people are talking in clicks and stuff. And I'd always just sit there by myself or maybe talk to one teammate or something, but I would sit there by myself because I was getting myself in the zone. I didn't think it was, I, I didn't want to go talk to somebody uh, that I was about to go, you know, compete against, especially when we got to, uh, time towards the playoffs. Like, I think, I don't think we should do that because we all sit together in the same stage and we're trying to make small talk with each other before we go and try to kick each other's ass. And so you know, I feel like I feel like that's a bit strange, but you know, to me, I never did music just the whole visualization. Just kind of getting... Yeah, I was always the same way. Like I was, so when I when I played football, I was a, I was a kicker, so I was like very individual, and I didn't like talking to anybody. I was just like, let me just yep. focus on what's happening, you know, and. And is what it is. There's a great parallel as a kicker. Absolutely. And golf too. Various, everyone always says, kicking's just like golf. I'm like, yep, yeah, it is kind of. Um, but the last, of. the last question <laughs> we have for you is, uh, Tim just wants to know what your favorite food is. I know you're, I know you're a big ketogenic <laughs> diet guy. So what is your favorite food? You know, I've, um, I, I have switched a little bit off of keto. I still do it sometimes for a tool, but I don't do it as strict as I used to. But uh, keto food, I used to love um, my Bulletproof coffee, which was, uh, it's 
coffee with a half a stick of butter and then heavy cream in it. It was just delicious. And for whatever reason, I could drink it and just have like the best mental clarity and go for like six hours without thinking of any food at all. So I loved bulletproof coffee. Um, I will say my, my kind of funny thing in that was when I was racing, my pre-race meal was a 22 ounce ribeye steak. <laughs> yep. Yep. I would polish that one down, but okay. Nice. So now, um, I, uh, I would say if it's a dessert, it's got to be like a, a Reese's Flurry. I really like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, man. Reese's is yeah, to go. Reese's is, is it. I agree with you there. And that's our, those are our, like, our, our softball uh, fan questions. Like, one of the things I really wanted to ask you is you mentioned the Jeremy Clements thing at that, that Road America race. That's one of my favorite races ever. I remember watching that one. It was so much fun. It was Because, like, let's face it. Like, road course races are the best races. Like, every race they had at Montreal was a banger. There was no bad races there. They were all sick. And that, like, how did you develop your road course acumen? Because you had some great finishes on road courses. Don't know. <laughs> just, just, I mean, just got in the car and drove. I, I mean, I worked, I worked with uh, Chris Cook and um, out at the Bondurant School in Arizona. And, and we did some stuff there, but I still didn't think I was very good at it. Um, and then came Mid-Ohio in 2017. I think we finished third or fourth, something like that there. And then I went to Road America and was just feeling good. And uh, this is the crazy part about Road America. So um, the ARCA race, we um, we qualified in the rain. I think we qualified second. Uh, led a good part of it. Me and Austin Sendrick had a great battle that whole race. This is like an hour before the Xfinity race. We go into turn one. He and Ty Majeski, uh, they go and they wreck, and I'm in the lead. And uh, But I had to check up for that. So somebody got in front of me. We're going down to turn five. And uh, we both wheel hop and wreck going into that corner. So there's a missed opportunity there. And then later on that race, uh, or that day, was the Jeremy Clemens deal. So, um, you know, got in position there to lead that race. And then he had fresher tires and, and tried to hold him off. And I thought I thought for sure he was going to wait and try to dive bomb into turn one and wheel hop. And I thought I could get back side by side with him. So it took me by surprise that he went where he did. Um, but then, you know, the next year at mid Ohio, um, I, i never was good at walking the line. I don't know why, uh, it never clicked for me. Um, but then the next year at mid Ohio, I think we finished second or third there. Um, then the Trans Am race again, uh, right before the Xfinity race sat on the pole, uh, led every lap except for the last one. I didn't understand the Trans Am <laughs> restart rules because I thought you were supposed to roll up to the box like NASCAR and everybody just started going. I was like, oh, crap, well, that's not what I was supposed to do. So finished second in that and then um, got the pole, won a stage, and then finished second in the Road America uh, Xfinity race. So had a lot of fun there. I think my average finish is like a 1. Point, or a 1.5 or 2 there. So I would like to go back and actually get that win there because it has eluded me so much. But – Man, I love that racetrack. It's so much fun. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a great racetrack. We like mm-hmm. I, I've been there a couple of times, and I, I've really I've always enjoyed my time there. It's just it's just just lots of fun. You know, people have fun yeah, there, and that's that's what makes racing great. Road courses are fun because like everyone's camping and they're cooking. Yeah, and there's room, and that's just it's great, man. Like I, I that's why they need more of that, more natural terrain road courses. What other track are you going to fly under a gigantic flaming bridge that says Speedville and has yeah. bratwurst all over it? I mean, it made me so hungry. I mean, it's like my favorite two things. You got bratwurst and you got the Sargento cheese billboard. It's like <laughs> yep. I'm starving going around the track. Now, one of my favorite memories, I will say, was that 2017 race. Um, we're going in the back section uh, towards Canada Corner back there around the kink. And it is just like the whole track's sunny. <laughs> And it is just a downpour back there. And we're all on slicks. And so here's me and Custer. We're sideways, holding on, doing everything we can. Here's Austin Cinder just passing both of us, acting like it's no big deal. I'm like, all right, I need to, get, need to go drive a sports car and figure out how to do this thing. Yeah, I you, think that is just rally cross experience. Would you do sports car stuff? Like if the opportunity came up? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I've, um, I've been approached to do the 24 hours a few times. The timing just didn't work out on it. But um, yeah, I would love to. It'd be a lot of fun. Do you have an FIA driver ranking? I don't even know what that is. So, so basically, if you if you if you you apply to the FIA to get driver ranking, if you have a silver or a bronze, you can have an IMSA career. If you have a gold or a platinum, you cannot because if you have a gold or a platinum, you're a pro, and oh. there's very few pro seats available because they're taken by guys like Elio Castroneves and. Guys who've won the Indy 500 and things like that. So, gotcha. 
Parker Kligerman tells a funny story that he got given a gold, so his IMSA career is over. He can never race because uh, no one's going to use him as the pro because your pro is usually someone like Patrick Long or someone with a lot yeah. of experience. But since you have limited experience, you could probably get a silver. Brian Vickers has a silver. So you well, probably you know, get the- my, um, I, I can tell you my iRacing road course thing is, looks terrible. So I um, – I don't know. If, if I can compare it off of that, I might be okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you just lobby, you put in your experience, and they give you a ranking. Like Kyle Busch was a platinum because, well, he's a champion. So yeah, he got, got a you. platinum. But I think you'd be I might all right. be able to get away with a low one then. I, maybe I can do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was going to commend you for not talking about iRacing at all during a pandemic interview, but you had to mention it. Well, I didn't say anything about racing. I'm just saying my ratings. So. <laughs> <laughs> but have you been iRacing a lot? Um, no, because here, I'll flip the screen here. This is, um, uh, my cats decided to, boy, how do I flip the screen? Gosh, I suck at this. Okay. My, um, oh, that just stopped it. Nope. Now we can't see it. Here we go. Okay. So, nope, that's me. Oh, I can there see James go. then. So, so it is uh-huh. a free screen thing and my cat decided to jump on this one, which then th- there is a middle monitor. But it flipped upside down, and then it ran on this one and stripped out all the cords. So, Ooh. Uh, yeah, I have not done any eye racing for that reason. Cats just <laughs> want to watch the world burn, man. They they give no. they give so little and they take so much. I have a cat too. So does James. They're the worst, you know. They they just they just take take take. Yeah, but, I did some dirt, dirt lay model stuff in January, but that was that was about it because then my cat decided to give me five hundred dollar bill, and I haven't felt like paying it. Fair, fair enough. But Matt, I, I don't know if we have if we have anything else for you. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us and being so candid. I love that you're so candid and just were able to talk to us, you know, about how you really feel about things. And that's and that's important. I think that's really going to open a lot of people's eyes to what it's like, you know, inside the garage. Yeah, and and, and not only that, we hope we uh, expose more people to who Matt Tiff is. I mean. Like you said, you were doing a really good job of trying to really get yourself out there as a Cup Series rookie in your first year. And unfortunately, with your medical condition, you're not in the car right now. But still, I mean, you're active, more active than drivers in the car on social media. And thank you for giving us the time to just talk to you and ask us some random questions. I mean, that was really cool. We we uh, we got to ask some really good ones, like the road course questions. Of course, you're driving with Kenny Schrader in the Arca days. That's really cool. But uh, I got we all got some new perspective on not just you, but just the sport as a whole, which is great. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me. I really uh, appreciate it, and we'll do it again sometime. One more thing. Please go ahead and plug your wife's boutique. Tell us all about it, oh, the yeah. website. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's at Reese Boutique, R-E-C-E Boutique, however you spell that. And uh, we have our grand opening in Charlotte, June 27th. So uh, it's a Saturday. So come on down. It's in the South Park area, which is um, so South Charlotte. So if you're around, come on by. We've been uh, working on this for a while now. So I'm so excited for her and her business venture. And so that's been my quarantine uh, work in there is getting that together. And we have so many boxes in our house that I'm so ready to get rid of. So uh, please come buy the stuff so we can pack our house with more boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, man. Love it. Thanks so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll be jarring back and forth on Twitter watching trucks racing tonight and cup racing okay. tomorrow. So really appreciate Sounds it. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Ed. We'll see you. All right. Take care. Thanks, Matt.